Well, greetings to everybody. My name is Steve Bell. I'm a senior advisor here at the Bipartisan Policy Center. We're very honored this morning to have Secretary Heather Wilson of the Air Force with us. Tell a little story. 20 years ago this year, the late Pete Domenici, Senator from New Mexico, and his chief of staff, Steve Bell, were sitting in Domenici's mother's kitchen, waiting for Heather Wilson and her husband to come talk to us. And after a very good talk and lots of coffee, they left and Domenici turned to me and said, what do you think? I said, Jesus, we would really be lucky to have somebody like that. He had never endorsed anybody for political office. Um, he endorsed Heather. They went through four elections in one year. It was the most expensive election at that time in the history of the United States Congress, House of Representatives. And I can tell you that the Heather Wilson campaign was not the reason for that extraordinary <laughs> expenditure. I think there were only five or six people that thought she could win. Fortunately, those five or six people were available and useful. But I can tell you that you can look at her biography and see everything she's done. But this is one of the most remarkable and tough-minded people I've ever dealt with. A, every race, it was going to be within one or two points. And every race, we had to pull out all the stops. And she was there morning, noon, and night. And she, a lot of times, gave the leadership the staff needed to keep on going. So I know that I'm supposed to say that she got an Oxford PhD and she was a Rhodes Scholar and she went to the third class of the United States Air Force Academy that accepted women and blah, blah, blah. But all that is immaterial to the fact that she is a woman of strength, of character, and someone that I am very proud to have been able to deal with and work for and with over the last 20 years. I want to give you Secretary of the Air Force, Heather Wilson. Now, what Steve didn't say is that uh, after I met with Steve Bell and Pete Domenici, and they, they said that they would, if I would run for the Congress, they would help me, what he didn't say was that I said yes before I knew what I was getting myself into. <laughs> Um, Steve, thank you for your, for your introduction and also for your friendship. And thank you for the focus on part of, uh, part of uh, for the Bipartisan Policy Institute's focus on, on part of the way we run the Defense part Department that probably doesn't get as much attention as it should, which is the people part of the business. There's always a lot of focus in this town, I think, on the next piece of equipment, um, but not a lot of focus on how do we develop the next, next generation of great leaders, and how do we attract great young Americans to service and develop them and encourage them to stay. And some of the difficult questions that, are, that, are, that surround that. I was fascinated by the, by the subject that you asked me to talk about today. Citizen soldiers, warrior ca caste, or mercenaries, who will serve in America's future military? It's kind of a stark way of framing the choice, it seems to me. Um, but what it really gets at um, is not only the structure in which we attract people to serve, but why do people serve? Why are people attracted to serve in the United States military? The first day of boot camp is a great equalizer. You know, it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter how much money you have who your parents are, whether you're a man or a woman or the color of your skin. What matters is can you, can you perform? Can you develop a better version of yourself than the 18-year-old kid who stepped off the bus? Do you have that in you to become better? Do you have the ability to lead others, to be a good follower as well as a good leader? Do you live by values that earn respect and trust? And every day, can you deepen those values by living them and make them just a part of your soul? If we're going to ask ourselves, you know, who will sign on the dotted line, put themselves in harm's way, 
long into the future for a major part of their lives. Some of the reasons that people do that will be the same reasons they've done that for generations. A sense of duty, family ties, the opportunity to maybe get out of a situation that doesn't look so promising for a young person's future or because they need a way to pay to coll for college, because they think it's a way, a way to a future that seems brighter than one that they have. But there is a broader concept of citizen soldiers. And uh, it's amazing to think that we are probably now three or four generations away from the end of the draft in 1973. So that young people today, it's not only that they don't have the experience of the draft, but their parents don't have the experience of having been subject to the draft. And their grandparents don't have that experience as well. So the draft, in some ways, was a great equalizer. Um, I, although there were so many exceptions to it, one wonders a little bit. And, and since 1973, we have developed into a very professional all-volunteer force. But here's the thing to keep in mind. There has never been anyone drafted into the United States Air Force. Everyone who has served in the United States Air Force has been a volunteer for the entire history of the service. So, so it is perhaps different that way than the other services. But it's uh, the, the thing that, that is different um, compared to conscription and what you might say is a pure citizen soldiery uh, is that every family and every young person knows they are not at risk of being called into service. So it's not just that a small percentage serve. And it's always been, a, since the end of World War II anyway, a fairly small percentage that serve. But it is those who choose not to serve know that they are not at risk of ever being called to serve in that way. My husband um, uh, graduated, was ROTC in Otterbein University in Ohio. And, and, uh, and I, he, had, he, he was not in ROTC to avoid the draft. He actually was ROTC because he wanted to be in ROTC. But he remembers the night when they drew the draft numbers. Now, I, was, I married an old guy. He's, you know, he's eight years older than I am. But, but uh, by the time I graduated from high school, that wasn't something that everybody waited to see. Where, and, but he remembers the night when everyone was gathered around the television um, watching, uh, watching the draft numbers to be picked. As it happens, his draft number was 18, which meant he was staying in ROTC. Um, but uh, but there, that sense of shared risk, and that moment in your life of where you were when they, when they pulled the draft numbers doesn't exist anymore, and it's three generations removed from us. But as I travel around military bases all over the world, one of the things I ask in my town halls is often, how many of you have a parent, grandparent, brother, or sister who's in the United States military? And I've never had an audience where it's less than a third of the people with their hands in the air. So there is a very strong family connection to service, which raises that question of are we becoming a warrior caste where those who serve are in families with long traditions of service? There's nothing in, it, in and of itself that's wrong with that and the desire to serve. But it does raise the question of a civil military divide, um, which, uh, which I think as, as leaders in the service, we have to continuously strive to overcome so that those who may be the first in their generation, uh, the first in their family to serve in uniform, are inspired to consider that option as well. It's not just those who serve in the military, though. The number of people in Congress who have served is also going down. And we're now at a point, a delightful point in our history, where in order to protect the vital national interests of this country, less than one in a th or less than two in a thousand serve in uniform. In context, during World War II, one in 10 Americans served in uniform. And then you add to that all those who were in defense industry and so forth, and Rosie the Riveters. So you think about that, so one in 10. So that meant every third house on the block, on average, had a blue star in the window. Today, with two in 1,000, you have to go on another 167 houses to find another family with a blue star 
in the window. And that shows up in our, in our government. And when the Air Force was born in 1947, military veterans uh, comprised about 43 percent of the U.S. Congress and actually grew from there. By 1971, it was almost a prerequisite to have served in order to be elected to the Congress. Seventy-three percent of members of Congress in 1971 were veterans and about eight out of ten U.S. senators. Today, it's less than 20 percent have actually worn the uniform. And outside the Beltway, I, I am concerned that the general population um, really hasn't shared the burden of the conflicts that we've been involved with. The United States Air Force has been in continuous combat operations for 27 years. In fact, it was 27 years ago this week that the Iraq campaign began to expel Saddam Hussein from Kuwait. And the Air Force never came home. 27 straight years of continuous combat operations. But that burden has fallen on a relatively small number of people and families. It's amazing to me that next year we will have kids graduating from high school who weren't born when 9-11 happened. Think about that for a second. It starts to make you feel old. But that does mean there is a risk of a disconnect between those who serve and those we seek to protect. But the good news is that the current public perception of the American military continues to be very high, uh, and, uh, and particularly so for the Air Force. I, Gallup did a poll last year, and they asked Americans, if you had a child or a grandchild about to enlist, what service would you recommend? And 64% said, join the United States Air Force. I'm not sure if that has to do with food or, uh, uh, but um, uh, not golf courses. No. no, but we are a highly technical force. We are very focused on the development of our people. Um, that's, uh, that's when I talk to, to uh, people in, the, in communities that don't, or that aren't close to the military or to a military base, there are many of them are surprised to learn that our senior non-career missioned officers, 92% of them have a college degree. Um, and uh, half of those, it's a bachelor's degree or above. Uh, very highly educated, very highly trained force. In fact, um, a, a member of the United States Air Force is four times as likely to have a college degree than the community as a whole. So there are tremendous opportunities for responsibility um, in the United States Air Force and for personal development. So we need the best and the brightest that our nation has to offer, men and women. And so the reason that people begin their service is probably always going to vary because of family circumstances or, or an opportunity or a way to pay for college or a sense of duty or, well, I was kind of, you know, I was floundering around in my freshman year and my dad said I had to do something. Um, there are a lot of different ways um, and, and reasons. But we can certainly influence why they choose to stay and choose to serve. So how do we attract the right people? to service, future airmen with the capacity for growth? How do we develop those airmen into joint warriors ready to meet the challenges of the 21st century? And how do we retain and reward them? All of those things go hand in hand. They're connected to each other, um, epitomized by probably our effort to retain qualified pilots in spite of attractive job offers outside of the service. Our airmen want mission satisfaction and that sense of purpose, and we need to give that to them. So how do we do those things, attract, develop, retain, and reward? Um, first, our doors have to be open to all, wide open to all. And uh, all, there's all kinds of evidence that shows the advantages gained through a diverse workforce. But we have implemented a lot of programs and policies that widen the applicant pool for key positions in the United States Air Force, stepping stones to leadership. And we've done the same uh, for things that, that have to do with choosing, you know, who gets to be a commander, who gets to attend selective educational opportunities. And starting this year, we are expanding our recruiting into new markets and intensifying into geographic areas where we haven't recruited well in the past. We're increasing the size of the force if we actually get beyond a continuing resolution. And um, 
and we will continue to recruit from the states where there are a large number of 18-year-olds, California, Texas, Florida. The South in general has always been very, uh, very prone towards 18-year-olds joining uh, the service. But about only one in 10 of our recruits actually comes from New England with its rich revolutionary history. And we intend to, to increase the intensity of our focus in geographic areas where we think there are young people who can be inspired to serve but may not have that family connection. So we're going to tell our story there to attract bright young men and women who can serve their country. We are also trying to make clear how natural a fit women are serving in the United States Air Force. 20% of the United States Air Force are women. We could not do our missions without them. And if you think about, I mean, just pause in your own mind here and think about the most protective person in your life. The person, if you were in a burning building, would come in to get you. The one who would do anything to protect you. My guess is half the people in this room are thinking of their moms. We need to tap into that desire to be one of the protectors of the innocent, which is what our American airmen do. We protect our vital national interests, and that's something that we say up here. But as airmen in our hearts, we're protecting our families, our way of life, our friends, our wingmen. We're the protectors. And that's a very feminine thing. So there is room in the Air Force for all kinds of protectors. And we need to attract them and develop them. We also need to change some of the ways we do things in the Air Force with our people. I am still amazed that, um, that uh, um, really almost 30 years since we changed uh, the, the allowed women to fly combat aircraft. You know, it took a long time to change equipment, and we're still facing some of that um, in the Air Force today. I remember when I was a um, young officer, there were, uh, there were real limitations on women flying combat aircraft because you had to, there were certain height and weight, and particularly height issues. Was, uh, um, the uh, the um, uh, seats were designed to be uh, accommodate from the 10th to the 90th percentile uh, for American men. And so, you know, that was just the way it, w the way it was. And most equipment was designed that way as well. And, um, and it really took a lot of work. I was on the Defense Advisory Committee on Women in the Services. Um, and we started asking, okay, um, and they'd say, well, you know, there are just a lot of women who don't qualify because, you know, they're not big enough to, f to fit into this spectrum. And, um, and, here, and this is the standard. Um, I said, okay, well, why don't we start designing equipment so that 90% of Americans can do the job? Why don't we change the design of the equipment? And while that takes time, and we all understand that, uh, but it's been a generation, folks. And I still am, I, you know, I was forward in Jordan um, this, this August and <laughs> talked to an F-15 pilot. Um, she is, uh, her last name is Whitney, so her nickname is Pratt. Um, <laughs> but uh, she, uh, she showed me that they continue to have problems with flight equipment that is not designed for women pilots um, and actually causes injuries. We shouldn't be at that point. 30 years after women have been flying in combat aircraft. So we will continue to try to attract women to prepare uh, for women to be in the service. But there are still times that I find myself um, pinching myself a little bit. When I came back to the service uh, to prepare for confirmation hearings, I was getting you know, briefed by everybody and trying to absorb all kinds of information so quickly. Um, and uh, I was sitting in one meeting, and I don't even remember what the subject was, but they were trying to you know, stuff my head with facts and keep me from embarrassing myself. And, and, uh, and there was a, a group of generals in this room trying to help me. They're wonderful people. And at the end of the meeting, I just said, oh, thank you so much, but you know, break, break. Um, I just want to say, I just asked them to tell me their stories and just kind of went around the room. 
And, uh, and I said, yeah, I just want to say, and there's probably four or five general officers in the room. Three of the general officers were three-star women generals. And I just said, I just want to say, you know, I'm at that time 56 years old. I've never been in a room with three women three-star generals before. I just want to say, I think this is really cool. Um, but it was even a reminder to me um, that for young women, for minorities, for first-generation Americans, it's hard to be what you can't see. And by being role models and making sure our role models are out there where younger women and minorities and others who haven't traditionally been strongly represented in the military can see what the possibility is for them, that there's a seat at the table, that there's an opportunity there, we will inspire more to come to serve. We are also seeking to retain um, some, some uh, great people in the service, uh, men and women. And one of the ways we're trying to do that is changing, you know, one of the big challenges about the 10-year point is that it's a great job, love to serve, love the mission, having trouble balancing family and the profession. And the rate of uh, the uh, rate of uh, the pace of operations is just so high. Uh, we're burning our people out, and 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 it becomes a family issue. So, can we better match the needs of commanders in the Air Force with an individual's desires without compromising the operational requirements? We have started a pilot program. It's inspired by the Nobel Prize-winning National Residency Matching Program used to match physicians. And uh, now you, I think you all know that you know if you're looking for a residency, you you interview and you kind of put your choices. And there's a there's an optimization program nationwide, and everybody knows on the same day where they're going to get their residency. Can we use that same algorithm to match airmen with their next assignment, so that we're optimizing um, the job gets done? But instead of assigning personnel, let's focus on developing talent and trying to meet the needs of the airmen at the same time we meet the needs of the service. It's a pilot project. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to move in that direction. We are a total force. We are an active guard and reserve. So we have full-timers. We have part-timers. We have people who rotate back and forth. In fact, my military aide um, is a reservist. And when you're walking down the halls of the Pentagon, you can't tell who's active, who's guard, who's reserve. We work side by side in uh, war zones and in the halls of the Pentagon. And we are working further to develop um, the opportunities for reservists um, and guardsmen in the service. Um, we're also reaching out to more young people. Um, we reestablished our internship program uh, for college students, which had been lost during the last sequester. And I hope, again, if we get beyond a CR, we will have 500 college interns in the United States, paid college interns in the United States Air Force next summer for college juniors in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, cyber, and acquisition so that we refresh the future of the Air Force by bringing in great young people um, uh, to, uh, to, to look at what the opportunities are for them, um, not just in uniform, but as civ civilians. So I am... Um, uh, I commend you again for focusing on the issues of on the issues of personnel. Um, the Air Force has always been a volunteer service and not a conscripted service, but we are full of citizens, some who are full time, some who are part time and reservists, but all of them attracted for different reasons, but over time develop their sense of purpose in part with us. It may have been Mark Twain, although that may have been apocryphal. It doesn't really sound like Mark Twain, but um, said that the two most important days in the life, in your life, are the day you're born and the day you find out why. I'm not sure that's entirely true, though, because it's not really about finding out why or finding a purpose. We really develop our purposes, don't we? By experience in the world, whether it's in faith or profession or work or in the service of your country, that sense of purpose is developed over time. 
And it's something that in the Air Force we need to recognize. The people may come to fly. They may come because of the college benefits. They may come to get out of a small town and go see the world. But if they come to fly, will they stay to serve? That's what we're seeking to develop. It's that deep commitment to a life of purpose through service in the United States Air Force. Thank you for your work, and I'd be happy to take some questions. Yes, uh, Madam Secretary, thank you very much for uh, the wonderful remarks. My name is Steve Tronosky. I'm a, an Army Reserve Officer. Um, I just wanted to, to, to. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I had the appointment with them uh, before the Air Force for okay. ROTC, so okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, but, uh, but I have two comments just to make on, on, on your remarks. The first is uh, I'm concerned about structural barriers uh, to people uh, exploring the Air Force specifically uh, for service opportunities. Uh, right now, for the 18 congressional districts of southern New York State, there's only a single Air Force ROTC detachment. Mm -hmm. So for the three million young people in Long Island, three million people in Long Island, you know, the two million in Brooklyn, two million in Queens, being an Air Force officer, unless they go to the academy, is structurally not an option. And so that's just one thing I, I wanted to raise. The other thing is, uh, I can't, I, I've, I've just believed in some of my readings, is the uh, onerous service commitment uh, to becoming a pilot, I think, um, is something that I think must be unpacked and explored two years for training, and then 10 years post-training uh, of, of service. And I, I just wonder what type of talent, what personal attributes, what entrepreneurial uh, things, risk-taking, a 19-year-old who may not be laser-focused on what they want to be at 34, mm -hmm. is the Air Force potentially screening out of its future general officer pool by, by not even letting them come in uh, for the, those uh, types of skills that uh, would propel them maybe to those levels? Thank you. Um, let me take, take both of those questions. Uh, I, when you look at where, do, where is the, first of all, um, uh, where does the officer corps come from? Because you mentioned ROTC in, in particular. Um, uh, we actually have more officers that come through officer candidate school or officer training school for us uh, than we do from the ROTC or the academy. So there, there, are, there are different ways to become an officer in the Air Force. I take your point, though, about ROTC, particularly, um, particularly in, the, in the Northeast, and intensifying our outreach to young people in the Northeast, which is why when we've, we've added a, about 600 recruiters to our force this next year, as we can, we, we're starting to grow the force on a steady, trying to get a steady growth in the force, and we're putting them in regions where we think we're underrepresented. Um, and so I take your point about ROTC in, in the New, New York area. With respect to active duty service commitments, we have no shortage of people who want to come in to be pilots. The problem is keeping them after the 10-year point because we are too small for what the nation is asking us to do. And the, operation, the operational tempo is just far too high. And frankly, there is a great option. And we have a short national shortage of pilots. Uh, there's a, 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 a wave of people retiring, re mandatory retirement from the airlines is 65. It's a wave of people retiring. Um, and, uh, and so we know that air, the airlines are going to be hiring about 4,500 pilots a year. There is now a legal requirement that those pilots have to have 1,500 hours of flying time to fly for, for an airline, even a regional airline. There's really, unless you're a crop duster, or you've, you know, there's a very, there's very limited opportunity to get 1,500 hours of flying time. I mean, if, if you were, you're probably a full-time Air Force pilot, depending on your airframe, for at least three years before you've accumulated 1,500 hours. So, so that's a lot of time. Uh, so there is a there's a tremendous demand for pilots. We're the ones who are training them. We train about 1,200 pilots. We're going to increase that to 1,400 a year. Um, but what we lose is 10 years of combat uh, combat flying experience, and you, that that is a huge problem. So retention is our problem, not accessions at the front end. Um, the cost to train a pilot is is uh, very very high. So when we when we talk to a young person about whether you want to fly, it's not to come in and experiment and see if this was what you want to do and three years go on to something else. We want people who are committed to it. And if we had to, um, if we had to, um, uh, if we didn't have enough applicants to come in the front door, we'd probably have to look at the service commitment. But honestly, there are enough people who know that's what they want to do, and they are willing to to be trained to a very high level and commit uh, 10 years to, to being a pilot. 
So we think that it's a very reasonable thing, um, uh, given how much it takes to train a combat pilot. Yes. Kathy Ross Kay from Blue Star Families. We can pre I appreciate your comments about women in uniform. In our Blue Star survey this past in our Blue Star survey this past year, we dove a little deeper into the experience of women in uniform and asked, surveyed them. Mm -hmm. Only one third of women in uniform said they had child care to meet their needs, mm -hmm. compared to two thirds of men who said they did. What are your responses to that in the Air Force? Interesting. Well, um, uh, child care and flexible child care. Uh, I think is a, is a major issue for families. Um, and it's, it's not something that I've delved into a lot in the last six months, um, but it was something that in my prior um, work with the Defense Advisory Committee on Women in the Services we did. There was a real effort to get high quality child care on military bases. Usually the biggest issue is the flexibility of it. Um, and uh, so it is uh, swing shift, night shift, uh, early mornings, uh, well, you've, you know, you've got an exercise, uh, so you've got to have long days, those kind of things that are often the harder parts of the child care issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I've been told by you have somebody you're meeting with that's very important. All right. <laughs> <laughs> they, met, they met you, Bell. <laughs> no, I think they met General Mattis or somebody like that. Thank you so much. Take care. We're going to have a, a panel of people talk about some surveys they've done and some recommendations that have been made uh, that directly relate to how do we get people to join, how do we have the flexibility when we're trying to compete with the Googles of the world for cyber talent? And what is the present disposition of American military families towards their service? And what can we do, as Heather said, not just to get them, but to retain them? Uh, the moderator for uh, this uh, event is going to be Dan Lamoth of the Washington Post, covers the Pentagon for them. Um, did a little work in Afghanistan, uh, did some Navy tours, um, and made some reports, for, uh, did a lot of reporting from the United States, the Navy uh, out in the oceans. I read where you went to the Republic of Georgia. I someday would love to talk to you about that. Um, he's filed several Freedom of Information Act um, requests that have been granted and have led to some great stories. So I am really happy that he agreed, given what's going on and all the time demands, that Dan Lamoth was willing to join us from the Washington Post to be the moderator of the next panel discussion. Dan. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate the kind introduction. Uh, I would like to introduce our panel uh, to the stage. Um, among others, uh, we will start with uh, Amber Smith. She is the Deputy Assistant to the Secretary of Defense, uh, Secretary Mattis, for Outreach. Um, she is also a former Army attack helicopter pilot, uh, a veteran of Afghanistan and, and other places. Uh, we will uh, have several short presentations here, and then we'll move into a moderated discussion. So. Um, I would ask uh, at this point for Amber, uh, David Chu, the president of the Institute for Defense Analyses to come to the stage. Uh, Kathy Roth Duque, uh, who you've already heard a question from, she's the CEO of Blue Star Families. And uh, Paul Yaki, who is a senior lead data scientist with Booz Allen Hamilton. And I'm sorry, David Chu as well. <laughs> He's here? Oh, the last chair is mine. Yes, ah. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, we will start with a, uh, a presentation here from uh, Amber Smith, uh, introducing a new uh, Pentagon uh, Defense Department um, initiative. So thanks very much. Thank you, Dan, and thank you to bipartisan Policy Center and to Blue Star Families as well. It's great to be here um, and to be a part of this very important discussion. I'm going to hold off for a minute so my presentation can come up on the screen. 
so you can follow along with me. Oh, my fault. Okay. So I want to talk to you all today about the civilian-military divide, how it relates to this bigger conversation about the future of the military, and really what the Department of Defense is doing about it. So on February 1st, the Department of Defense will be launching the This Is Your Military initiative. It is an outreach initiative, and its intent is to reach out to the American public to educate and inform them on um, what the military is doing today, as well as really introduce them to the less than 1% who is currently serving in the military to the 99% who is not. We want to showcase how the military is relevant to Americans' lives on a daily basis and how innovative the department is and how we're a force for good. We really want to dive into some of the missions that people don't necessarily connect with the military. On the humanitarian side, people might not, that don't have that direct connection to the military, they might not be thinking about the military's involvement in the responses to the hurricanes in Texas in Puerto Rico, in Florida. So we really want to showcase how broad the missions are within our military. And, and we really want to talk about some of the misperceptions that exist out there in society today. We've noticed that a lot of people are very familiar with some of the negatives that go along with serving in the military, but not necessarily the positives. So we just want to get the facts out there uh, and in doing so, balance the scale. So yes, people might still be familiar with the negatives, but they're also familiar with the positives that come along with serving. Uh, we haven't necessarily had a voice in this space for some time, and that has allowed sort of the hero Hollywood side that you've seen um, be in control of some of the narrative. And we just want to get back into that space so we're getting the actual, the accurate uh, perceptions of what the military does, who is serving in the military, and what our missions are out there for people. So what we're doing may be a little bit different than what you're used to seeing from the department. Uh, we often talk to a national security audience, a military and defense audience um, inside the Beltway, but we want to break through that layer, and we want to talk to an audience that is broader than that, people who may not be familiar with the military, who don't care about the military, or just have those misperceptions that I talked about. Uh, so we really want to articulate a message of what the military is doing, tell that military story to a non-military audience, um, and really create some interest for people who don't necessarily care. Uh, my office specifically will be engaging with our regular stakeholders, including the media, nonprofits, business, educators, um, MSOs, VSOs, think tanks, um, Hollywood, film, scripted, non scripted, and then the sports leagues as well. Also, a really big component to this initiative is our internal audience. We are going to be working very closely with all of the services. They have fantastic outreach programs that exist today that go all the way down to the community level. So we will be, very, we will be working very closely to leverage some of those programs that are already in place. Uh, this is essentially going to be an, um, an umbrella initiative that connects all of the services um, into one message will all be connected through this initiative. So a big question is why is the department uh, doing this now? But the, it's always been in the best interest of the department to connect with the American public. And from our own internal data, we have seen that the civ mill divide is expanding. That ultimately is a threat to the viability and the sustainability of the all-volunteer force, which in the long term has some national security risks. So some of the trends that I was talking about that we've paid attention to about why this is important that we tackle this now, uh, the majority of young adults today think that when you join the military upon departure, you're going to leave with a physical injury, a mental or an emotional injury, and you're not necessarily going to be able to adapt 
properly back into society after your service. That translates to why would you join the military if you know you're going to be broken in some capacity when you leave, um, which is not good. Um, also, for those of us who work in the national security place, uh, space may think that this is kind of ridiculous, but people outside of it actually find that or think that if you serve in the military, you're going to be lonely. You can't have a family. You can't have a pet. Uh, you know, they don't think that women can serve in most of the jobs that they can serve in, and that most jobs are those trigger pullers, the infantry, the ground um, type jobs that are going to be on the front lines in combat. That's what people think of when they think of the military. Uh, and then something that's also alarming, when we found that if you have that direct connection to a, someone who has served in the military or a veteran, that that connection itself sort of fixes those misperceptions because they're having that direct connection with someone who's been there and done that and is able to speak accurately about the military. Uh, in the mid-90s, about 40% of households in America had that direct connection within their family. Today, about 20 years later, we're seeing it only as 15%. So you're seeing how drastically things have changed in the past 20 years. So what are we doing about it? We want to give Americans the opportunity to get to know who is serving, the who they are, why they serve, and what their missions are. Um, a lot of people aren't they, they think combat, the first thing that they think about when the military, they think combat, you join the military, you're into combat. We want people to see that we're more than that. The military is more than just a fighting force. We're a force for good. Like I mentioned, we have all of the humanitarian missions. Um, serving in the military is one of the um, best leadership institutions that exist in the world today. Uh, you see these very young individuals um, being in charge of equipment worth of millions of dollars. They're having to make life and death decisions sometimes in a split seconds. So they really get all of this experience at a very young age um, that is priceless um, and also very valuable once you leave the military and go back out into society. So those are some of the things that we want to show the American people. Um, we also, as I mentioned, we want to talk about how we're relevant. Why does the military matter to you as a taxpayer? Why should you be paying attention? Uh, and then as well as showing that balanced life, we want to take it past the nine to five. I know that doesn't necessarily work with military life, but we want to take it past the daily grind into the family life, what it's like to serve, um, and for your families as well. So this is going to primarily be a digital uh, platform initiative. We're going to be utilizing social media. Social media gives us that opportunity to break through uh, to that second and third layer uh, to reach a broader audience. Um, we're also going to be engaging with the media um, in, in terms of both earned media and our press operations at the Pentagon. Um, we're going to be looking to engage with senior leaders within the department um, to continue this conversation and make sure we're talking about um, exactly what I've told you so far. So, uh, as I said, we start, um, the official launch is February 1st, and they're broken down into monthly themes. February is We Are Connected, and um, if you just want to take a quick look, we're really going to be hitting some different sides of the military as um, we move forward in 2018. So right now we're still in the soft launch. Uh, some of you may be on our distros that you'll be seeing some products that we'll be sending out. Uh, for February, we're producing 12 videos. Um, they are going to be different. They're not going to be standard DOD government style videos. They'll be more of now this vice style videos that you see on Facebook, looking to engage with that different style audience than we're used to connecting with. Uh, we'll have monthly graphics and posters a very detailed social media toolkit that will be available to everyone. Um, we'll be producing op-eds as they relate to the months, and uh, we'll have a YouTube channel that has sort of a mini documentary series that uh, highlights different service members and what they're doing on their off time, how it relates to their military uh, service as well. And there you can see what some of our handles are for Facebook. Um, really, the connector here is our hashtag. It's KnowYourMill. 
Um, that's what's going to be connecting us on all platforms as it relates to this initiative. Uh, we're really going to be looking at our reach. Uh, we pay attention to our social media analytics, and that's going to be um, our big one in terms of success. And really, the best way you can help us with this initiative is to really engage with us. Uh, use our hashtag, um, engage with us on social media, talk to us and give us some of your stories. Um, that's what we want to do with this, or with this initiative, is get the information about the service member, those who've served veterans, people who go out and start their own businesses after their service, um, and just want to talk about what it's like. So hashtag know your mill and looking forward to your questions in a few. All right, thank you very much, Amber. Uh, our next, next presentation, uh, Kathy Roth through Kay and Paul Yaki uh, will be walking us through some of the findings and one of the surveys that we want to discuss today. Uh, and it seems to me it relates directly back to a lot of what Amber was just uh, kind of expanding upon and how we link those two together, I think, is a key part of this discussion. Yes, terrific. Thanks. I'll see if I can. I'm not... Oh, wrong direction. Oh, do we, for my, our slides, are they, uh, just keep going? There we go. OK, oh, and I'm going to do this one first. Um, before we go to the slides, I want to just thank everyone for being here. This is an amazing, full, uh, standing room only uh, crowd. So awesome to get that kind of response. Blue Star Families has had a tremendous experience partnering with the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, also, we love what DOD is doing with this, uh, this um, initiative, and we're right there with you. We think this is exactly what we need to do. Um, Blue Star Families started nine years ago. It was created by military families who felt that we were very motivated to continue to serve, but it was difficult to do that and still see our families thrive, that we needed to make changes we needed an organization where the people who were affected could have a seat at the table and be involved in making those changes both at the policy level and in communities. We've grown a lot since that time. Um, our national survey, our, our annual survey, gets released in Congress and briefed um, to the Department of Defense and other uh, nonprofits. We have over a million people use our programs and resources. We have about 54 chapters and communities and neighborhoods uh, with local boots on the ground around the country and overseas. Um, our mission is to tell this story, and you are helping us to do it right now. I want to shout out to the um, hundreds, if not thousands, of Blue Star family members who are live streaming with us today and asking questions. Um, the heart of what we do is to tell the story. We have a survey um, that uh, we d can do annually that helps us see trends. Many of you have those on your um, seats and you can come to our website to see more about it. There's a couple things I just want to highlight for you. Top issues and then a little deep dive on women's service members. Blue Star Families believes that we are strongest as a nation when the families who serve its country are thriving and when they are connected to the na their neighbors in their communities. There's a long way we have to go with both of those items. The great work that the DOD has done in exposing the disconnect from how many of our neighbors um, misunderstand us shows us the opportunities and what we can change. I wanted to highlight with my few minutes some of the top issues from this year's survey. We have a 60-page um, comprehensive report that has fascinating information. I urge you to look at it, but I want to highlight a few things. We ask people, service members, military spouses, veterans and veteran spouses. We ask them a number of questions. For service members and for military spouses, we ask them, what is your number one concern? What is the number one issue for you in continuing to serve your country? For the first time this year, the number one issue was time away from family. It's been pay and benefits for the last several years. Um, and uh, we had issues about uh, PTSD and um, uh, combat deployment as the number one issues before. Time away from family, that's incredibly important. 75%, nearly 75% of service members and family members say that the current operational tempo, not just deployments, but trainings, moves, um, uh, geographic all of these things are making life unsustainable. They can't keep going the way they're going. More than four out of 10 have had more than six months separation in the last year and a half. 
I'm not talking about special forces. I'm talking about our entire military. This is an army who, if you joined in 1970, you would not have deployed away from your family ever in 20 years. Now we're getting more than six months out of 18. So number one, time away from family. I want to bring that to your attention. Spouse unemployment is a crippling issue in a 21st century workforce where the majority of working class and middle class families need two incomes to meet their family goals. As the civilian unemployment rate has plummeted, as the post 9-11 veterans, which we saw a real problem as having a higher unemployment rate than civilian counterparts, has effectively, through um, cross-sector um, effort, declined to below the civilian rate, military spouse unemployment has not only held steady, it's, it's risen. We have 28% unemployment for military spouses compared to 3% for civilians. And of those, the minority who are actually employed, most of them earn less than $20,000 a year. This is a big factor for why people are leaving the military, because they need their families to thrive. They need those second incomes. These are spouses who can earn significantly more. We are willing to sacrifice to support our country, but we can't cripple our families. So this requires policymakers' attentions. One thing that we have seen and that has uh, alarmed us is the declining rate of military family members to recommend service. When I first started studying this issue in the late 90s, early 2000s, it was over 80% of um, service members recommended service to their own children. Today's um, uh, Army recruits, the Army tells us 84% of those come from a military family. The first year we looked, it was 27, it was 57% who recommended service, and then it's been steadily falling, so that this year only 40% of currently serving military are recommending service to their own children. That's something we need to pay attention to if we're looking at how we have a future force. Speaks directly to the work that Amber is doing, um, and I hope it motivates people to recognize that personnel issues are actually as urgent and exciting as acquisition issues are. Civilian community integration, many of the problems we see from um, in, uh, depression to um, domestic violence to um, substance abuse, a lot of these have an underlying issue of isolation. Actually, unemployment has an underlying issue of isolation, since many people find jobs through people they know. We asked, we did a deep dive on community integration this year. We have an infographic some of you can look at. But one of the questions we asked was, do you feel that you belong to the community in which you live? Most service members and spouses said, no, I don't. They also said that they would like to. Keep in mind that the majority of military families, over 70%, do not live on installation anymore. So the fact that they're in their communities but don't feel they belong, that's undermining their ability to be happy. When we cross sector that, we see that those who do feel they belong feel better about the, being in the military are more likely to recommend service. We also asked, how many conversations have you had with someone not connected to the military in the last month, just in bands? One to three, more than 10. 30% said zero, zero. So that's something we need to change because that's hurting us as a country, as a military, but also as a country because our civilian neighbors need to know us. Next slide. Just quickly, oh, I'm doing the slides. <laughs> Not used to that. We wanted, this year we wanted to look particularly at female service members with only 25% of, of 18 to 24s, male and female, being qualified to serve with this low propensity to serve. We really need female service members. It's not a nice to have, it's a need to have. But the experience of women in uniform is not the experience of men in uniform. And we have to look at that and be honest about that. Female service members are just as patriotic and are just as motivated by the mission. But one thing you need to do if you have a family and you are serving is find childcare to meet your needs. You cannot do your mission without that childcare. Only one third of service women have that. Two thirds of service men do. Only one third of service women do. We can't honestly ask them to meet their missions if we can't help them find the childcare to meet their needs. The operational tempo, uh, I have to get a little closer. Uh, is, it, is it too stressful to maintain healthy work life, fa work family life? Two thirds of men say it's too stressful, almost 80% of women. We need to know that. And probably that's connected to that childcare easily issue. For dual military couples, why are you leaving service? For both of them, 
insufficient time with family. Top stressors for female service members is impact of the service on their children. For male service members, it's deployment. These are millennials, and they're free people, and they get to choose not to serve. They are very committed, and they love that, mi that mission. I'm a baby boomer family. My husband served 30 years. We cared and worried a lot about the effect on our children. But there is an increased concern for this generation. We have to know that and have to honor that. And we have to look at our future um, when we see that. We have more differences to point out between the two. One of them is that female service members have a lower level of confidence in their military and political leadership than male service members do. It will help us field a better military if we understand what is going on with the people who are serving and how to address those issues. Blue Star Families works hard to do it. We are very honored to have the extraordinary generosity of Booz Allen Hamilton in giving us um, data scientists to give us an ability to do even deeper dives. That lets us ask questions that policymakers such as Dr. Chu ask us to help us understand what's behind those numbers more. I'd like to introduce Paul Yaki now. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so I'm Paul Yaki from Booz Allen Hamilton. Uh, we started our relationship with Blue Star Families uh, a few months back uh, with the stated goal of really taking a deeper dive and looking at some of these analyses that uh, Blue Star Families hasn't had a chance to get to yet. Um, our relationship with them started with an initial look at some of the qualitative data. So looking at some of the responses that Blue Star Families are actually putting into this survey. There's a lot of free text open responses for people to actually put in what their thoughts in their own words, what their thoughts are. Um, this particular slide here highlights some of the work we did uh, looking at a question that asks, how do uh, changes and proposed changes in benefits for families impact your willingness to recommend? And the approach we took was to take um, an example like this. So this is a military spouse who's clearly not very happy about some changes that are coming down the pipeline or being discussed out there, and ran an automated topic extraction algorithm over that. So the current way that this is typically done in social sciences is to have someone go through, read through the responses individually every time, um, come up with a set of codings for them, and try to turn those into kind of discrete labels and saying that, OK, this one's talking about benefits, this one's talking about retirement, pay cuts, those kinds of things. It's a very time consuming and becomes more laborious as you get more and more um, respondents taking the survey. Um, so as the survey grows in time and um, use, um, it'll probably get beyond. I think there was something like 7,000 in the last year that took this. And so we had a subject matter expert go through, uh, actually code up what was extracted from here. And these are kind of the quick way to digest what these topics were. Uh, these are three here that responded here. So things relating to stress, uh, child care, services, health care, dental um, care as well. And so these are impacts, and these are the actual voices of survey respondents speaking out. These are what they're saying. This isn't just the survey out there um, and you know, selecting a multiple choice. These are their words. And so the way to interpret those, what they're called those word clouds, is that uh, the bigger the word in there, that means that more people are saying that, and that's more important. So you can see kind of healthcare, dental, stress. Those are huge words that a lot of the respondents are talking about in response to this question prompt. Um, the second part of our analysis uh, that we've taken with Blue Star Families is to look at some of the quantitative data. And these are some of the more multiple choice type questions or Likert scales asking, you know, do you strongly recommend, do you strongly not recommend, something like that. And particularly today, we wanted to focus on your willingness to recommend service. What are the factors that go into your willingness to recommend service to a close person near you? Um, some of the detractors are deployments greater than 48 months. So we saw a general trend of people who had longer deployments. They were very unlikely to recommend service to a young person near them. Um, feelings of lack of support from DOD. Um, in regards to kind of personal and support for their children uh, from their chain of command. So kind of building on comments from the panel here today, you know, these are huge, huge factors in people's willingness to recommend service. Um, we also found a trend of people who have been out from the service shorter periods of time are less likely to recommend as well. Um, and kind of the flip side, people who have been out for greater than 30 years are also more likely to recommend. Um, so, the question here is, you know, requires further investigation. Is this a just a fog of memory? You know, as you get 
grow, <laughs> separate longer, you've grown more fonder of your you know, younger years of experience, or is there really truly a, a generational shift in the military? And I believe the other examples we've seen and heard of, you know, this, there is an increasing demand on our services, and the importance here is you know, we need to listen. Um, high levels of stress from the op tempo, as Kathy was just saying, uh, these are placing significant demands on the population here for uh, willingness to recommend. Uh, so pivoting to the promoters, you know, things that are, we're doing well, um, and pr particularly for the topic today of kind of the military cast, p families who have more than five family members are much more likely to recommend service to a young person. Um, kind of, when we were in the middle of the analysis, that one just popped right out that, you know, if you are heavily invested in your family, um, you are willing to recommend and promote. And that really just builds upon, you know, the findings that we've already seen in other areas of the survey. Um, let's see. Feeling of like a valued member of your community also was people were much more likely to recommend service. So anything that can be done to encourage uh, military members to be engaged with the community, to feel like they are part of their local community. Um, you know, that's always a difficult thing with frequent moves and deployments and things like that, but those have huge impacts on people's willingness to stay in and promote, promote the service. And the same goes with feeling supported by your chain of command in regards to your children. Um, if you're not getting the support from your chain of command in regards to your children, um, that can have a negative effect. And if you are feeling promoted, um, you're more likely to you know, promote military service to a young person near you. So um, we have a lot more work to do with this, and we're continuing our partnership beyond here. And we're looking forward to uh, keeping deeping dive, a deeper dive into the survey results. So thank you. All right, uh, one last mini presentation here. Uh, Dr. David Chu, uh, again with the uh, Institute for Defense Analyses uh, will lead us through a uh, short presentation here, and, and then we're going to move into our discussion. Well, thank you very much, Dan. It's a privilege to join you this morning and to offer a few words about a report uh, emanating from a panel convened by the Bipartisan Policy Center just over a year ago, focused on very much the issues we're discussing this morning. How do you sustain the success of the volunteer force, the theme of Secretary Wilson's uh, comments. And, uh, uh, Kathy was one of the co-chairs, along with uh, 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 Secretary Panetta, uh, Senator Talent, uh, uh, General Jones. Uh, I was privileged to be a member of this uh, panel. And the letter from the co-chairs, I think, captures the spirit of this session this morning. It starts with the sentence, the foundation of U.S. military power is the quality and morale of the men and women who have chosen to serve the nation. The issue, of course, is how do you sustain the success that Secretary Wilson spoke to of the volunteer force the last 40-some years going forward. Uh, and uh, the, the central conclusion of this group is that the paradigm we followed to a certain extent over this period of time, uh, that is more or less one size fits all in terms of career management, how we treat personnel, may not be the right answer in the next uh, generation. And the report endorses four principles. Uh, and this, hence the title, I think there are copies of the report on the table outside, FAST, uh, F-A-S-T, F for fully engaged American society, A for adaptable to new threats as they arise, S for sustainable, both financially and culturally, the issue we've been discussing in the last few minutes, and T for technically proficient. And there is a set of recommendations, I won't try to go through all 39 recommendations here in the, these last few minutes, but let me just highlight a few that I think are particularly interesting under each of these four principles. First, in terms of engaging American society, uh, coming back to what Kathy spoke to so eloquently, the need to be thoughtful about the fact that the spouse should have a career too. Now, that's really an issue for which there's no magic bullet, there's no panacea here, and to a certain extent the report reinforces what the department's already doing, but calls for more action, action on issues like childcare, action on issues like relocation, action on issues like job opportunities for the spouse, meaningful career opportunities. The other uh, recommendation under this heading that I think is very interesting, and Secretary Wilson touched on her remarks with the pilot program she mentioned, and that is giving service members more say over their careers and what happens to them, consistent with the needs of the institution. That's why I think the matching program, which was one of the specific recommendations of this report, try this out. Let people uh, essentially bid, as it were, 
against the needs institution for the jobs. The institution decides who gets what, but you hear in a decisive way from the individual what he or she would like to have, and you listen to that uh, uh, information in making your decision. Adaptable. Uh, let's start by being honest about what the needs of the military really are. And this is something that Amber spoke to her in her remarks. It's a variety of needs. They're not all the same. They have different levels of experience that might be, in quotes, required. That might mean different career profiles based upon the kind of uh, uh, skill needs that are there. Think about a continuum of service. Think about, as Secretary Wilson celebrated, more movement back and forth between the active and reserve forces of uh, the United States. At the moment, once you leave active duty, Active force, candidly, is not all that happy to see you come back. Why is that? Could we not draw more vigorously on the talent of the reserve force going forward? And finally, some of the Congress has opened the door to a great deal in the last Authorization Act. More emphasis on lateral entry. Some skills are excellently acquired in the civil sector. The military does not need to train for that skill itself. May not, in fact, be the best source of that training. Cyber is the situation many people raise in that regard. Could the military not appoint directly with civil life, as it has long done for the clergy, for lawyers, and for clinicians? For doctors, the military does have medical school, but most of the doctors come out of civil society, appointing directly as O3s in the officer court. We could do that. Congress has now opened that up to O6 for certain areas, at least within a limited uh, manner. Sustainable. Of course, there's the issue of funding. Secretary Wilson spoke to that, and really the need for political bargain going forward over a number of years as to what kind of funding the department can enjoy so we can plan properly. But beyond that, the report raises an interesting issue. We'll see tomorrow morning when the department unveils its national defense strategy what had an impact, and that is make personnel one of the central features of the national defense strategy. Focus on that as the core foundation, as everyone agrees, for the excellence of the American military. And finally, to technical. Uh, should we have technical tracks? As we already do, as I suggest, the professions, it's somewhat separate. The Navy has that in a separate competitive category for the supply, supply corps. Could we use warrant status more vigorously, as the Army does for aviation, rotary wing pilots, especially uh, across the four military uh, services. And for civilians, the part does speak extensively to civilians who are part of the total force for the Department of Defense. Sh we should be investing in their education in the same vigorous way in which we invest in education and training for military personnel. We don't do that today. We leave it to them to find it for more or less on their own. We should change that paradigm. But it all comes back to where Secretary Wilson started us. The most important responsibility of the leader's department is to be sure the department can indeed recruit, retain, and ultimately inspire the people who it needs to have in its ranks to make the American military effective. That's the gist of the report. Thank you, Dan. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, we'd like to uh, move into the uh, discussion here. And, and as a part of that, we'd like to invite uh, Blaise Mistel uh, up to the stage. He's the Director of National Security here at the uh, Bipartisan Pe Policy Center. And uh, we will lose a guest or two in the process. All right, uh, off the top, uh, I was struck uh, while reading through the Blue Star survey results. Um, in particular, when you look at how women view the military, how women view service, uh, and the challenges that go with that in their own lives. And then when we square that against this new DOD initiative, it seems to me that there's, there needs to be multiple discussions had. You need to be talking to the spouses uh, or potential spouses. You need to be talking to male and female alike who sometimes have a different, different set of concerns. Uh, I, I guess really for any of our guests, how would you approach those different conversations? Uh, what needs to not be left out? And where do you need the nuance? Because I think that's frequently the struggle here is so often things get stereotyped. Um, I think we need to be honest with the fact that the experience that people wearing uniform who are female are having a different experience than the people who are wearing uniform who are male are having. Perhaps when we began integrating women the into the military, the idea was that they were supposed to just become men in the military. And what we've seen is that that isn't what happened, and it's not an option for that to become what happens. Um, 
that we need to populate, we need the highest level of talent for these very complicated jobs that are only getting more complicated. We have to take a little bit more of a human-centered design. The needs of the military are um, preeminent. And we serve and we love to serve because of that compelling mission. But the needs can't be rigid. We have to understand what are the needs of the service member who can choose to not serve and who is so intelligent and skilled and competent because that's the kind of person we need today. Not the kind of person we necessarily planned for when we created a standing force in 1947. We wanted a non-high non school graduate who could serve for two years. That's not who we need now. We need to honor the fact that that's the the person we're forming and be open to making those changes for it, commensurate with the needs of the military. We are supposed to be a civilian force that reflects the values of the nation. So we can't regret the fact that the values of this force also reflect the values of civilians in this nation, which is to you know, have a family and foster a healthy family. Uh, Amber, when, when you look at presenting who's currently in the force to the American public, um, how do you go about doing that in terms of the success stories that are already there uh, and in terms of while well, at the same time acknowledging some of these challenges that exist? So I would say that it is very exciting times for women that are serving in the military as they can try out for all positions. Uh, so a lot has changed uh, over the past few years. And so what I'm looking to do from as someone who's leading this initiative is to really show those stories, go out and talk to the women who are essentially um, being the first in some of these positions and talking to them about what it is like. Um, because we're talking about the best of the best of the women who are attempting to go into these new roles and these new positions in the military. And we want to talk to them. What is it like from a leadership perspe uh, perspective um, compared to the previous jobs that they have been in? And just give the American people um, an inside look to what it is like to be a female in the military and the great things that they're accomplishing. Are there any challenges or discussions uh, that need to be had or that you're having? Um, it seems to me, I know it comes up in my own journalism at times, where you'd like to highlight some of these stories, but there's concerns about not wanting to put a target on your own back by talking about yourself. Well, I think it needs to be an ongoing conversation. Things are always going to be changing. Um, and we're always going to be adapting to things as they uh, come up. And, and so we'll be looking at it from that perspective, I guess, is just continuing to talk about the issues as they arise in the moment. And I think there's some specific things that would make a huge difference. Allowing for this flexibility, the way the bipartisan policy, let people take a, a, a longer family leave or a bee billet at a critical time without derailing their career. For organizations such as Blue Star Families, work on getting people integrated in the communities where we live because we see that alleviates things. Often you can find better child care arrangements if you are better integrated in your community. So both in the government sector and in the nonprofit and non-governmental sector, there are actions we can take that can let the women who love to serve continue to serve without compromise to their families. And, and if I could jump in on that. You know, if you create an sort of more of a marketplace in terms of the careers and the options that people have in choosing where they go next in their military careers, mm -hmm. you can reflect some of this both at the at the female service member level, but also for the entire military family. You know, it's and and it also reflects national security priorities, right? If someone has the choice to say stay in San Diego because that's where their their spouse is working, that's where their children are in school, maybe they're giving up something in terms of you know, where they can be promoted further down their career, but it's a choice that they can make, right? So it's not something that they need to stand up for necessarily and, and tell the department, but you let them speak. Someone else who maybe doesn't have those concerns, can PCS can change duty stations more frequently. Uh, someone who's in it just to make money maybe will want to go to Alaska because there's more money in it for them to go to a place that's less popular. Um, but I think the important thing to understand or to think about here, at least from, from my perspective as the director of national security here at the BPC and the way that we framed it in our report uh, on the fast forces, this aligns with the national security needs of the United States. I think you know, when Secretary Mattis releases the national de defense strategy next week, he's going to talk about a full spectrum of threats that goes beyond 
uh, just the traditional ones that the force was created for in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. And yes, we still need grunts, and we still need an infantry, and we still need people who want to become the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. But there's a lot of other things that we need in the military today that maybe didn't exist then. We need, as Dr. Chu was saying, and I can't really do a very good Dr. Chu impression, but I'm just filling in for him. Uh, we need cyber warriors. We need warrant officers who fly helicopters. We need medical personnel. We need public affairs officers. Uh, we need a whole lot of things that are career paths that don't necessarily align with the way that the military wants your career to go right now. Um, and if you create more flexibility in that career path, you both get a wider range of talents that better reflects the needs of the military and the needs of the national security environment today, and you let people uh, choose what is the, their priority and, and reflect the needs of their families uh, or, or themselves. Uh, I'm perhaps asking for your in, uh, informed speculation here, uh, but it seems to me when we're talking about spouse jobs in particular, uh, when we look at the, the workforce outside the military, there's been a lot of frustration and a lot of discussion about whether or not um, the shift to more people moving to Washington, New York, other big cities, because that's where the jobs are, um, or at least a lot of the higher paying jobs, uh, makes it a struggle um, where you, you maybe you would what, like to stay in some of your home states. And when we, when we shift that to the military, you know, if, you, if your husband or your wife is stationed at Fort Bragg or in Alabama or something like that, there are not necessarily all those jobs uh, off base that you might have elsewhere. How do you think DOD um, and really th this whole uh, town should be talking about that sort of thing? With the proliferation of the opportunity for remote work, that, that concern goes away. Um, so we, we do need to make it more possible for military spouses to work remotely by making them as a workforce more visible. That's something Blue Star Families works hard at, but DOD has a role in telling that story, that there are qualified people who have jobs and we can help you with them. We have a program, Blue Star, to connect people. The Department of Defense has military spouse employment program to try to coordinate these better. Uh, we have a problem with public-private partnerships with DOD. We need to do better on that to make those better. 78% of spouses who apply for GS positions do not get hired. Even though there is a, a hiring appointment authority, but most hiring managers don't use that to appoint those qualified spouses. We need to do something about that. One idea that is to have Congress require a report from hiring managers about why they're not hiring these spouses. Spouses um, are not allowed to run businesses on many installations. These are legacy rules from um, uh, when, when they were competing with the MWR, but there are so many being a spouse employed out of your home. That's a barrier for the maybe only 20% of people who live on base. Um, but Let's get rid of those barriers that don't help anyone. And if you do allow people to stay longer in um, a place or choose their duty station, then people can find more um, uh, find work that meets their needs. So we think this is an extremely solvable problem. It just needs the attention. I'll throw, Amber, I don't know if you had something to. Go ahead. One one more issue that I'll throw in is you know something like thirty percent of jobs in the United States today require profession, professional licensure from, from a state. Uh, if you're a military spouse that is PCSing every three to four years, that's a lot of hoops to ju be jumping through just to be able to get a job every time your spouse moves. Um, and so one of the issues that we're really interested here in at BPC that we're working on this year is how can you reduce some of those barriers for military spouses? How can you create either reciprocity across states so that military spouses can get licenses more easily? How do you get help from the Department of Defense and maybe at least pay some of the costs associated with getting a professional license if, if, if you're moving? Um, but that is a, huge, uh, is a huge barrier to both uh, military spouse employment, but also economic opportunity and a tax base for states that they're missing out on. And I would say that um, family life definitely plays into a stable or a non-stable sort of overall being of a service member. Um, and that plays into spouse employment, that plays into all the PCS moves that we've talked about uh, as well. But I think something that you talked about is big um, in terms of allowing the licenses to cross state lines, reciprocity, so that we are helping spouses um, maintain their, per their professions as they support <laughs> their spouse through their military career. Uh, I'd like you to elaborate uh, for, for whoever's comfortable with the question. 
Um, we've, we've talked about keeping people in place longer, families in place longer. I often hear that referred to as homesteading. Uh, and for a long time, that had kind of a negative connotation to it. Um, how do you challenge that? And how do you challenge that on a senior level where maybe you can change the minds? Look, I think we, we've struggled a lot with that in, in our report because a lot of these issues are cultural. A lot of opportunities that we talk about in our recommendations exist as pilot programs or opportunities maybe that people don't know about but that they can take. You can, you know, you can take a gap year now in the Navy, um, whether it's to, to start a family or pursue further education. But as long as it's a pilot program, as long as it's something that is not very well known about, right, that, that cultural stigma remains attached to it that, oh, that's something that's going to leave a black mark on your file when you're going up for promotion. Um, and so it is something that requires, I think, change from the, from the very top. Uh, one of the other issues that we ran into when we had uh, our, 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 our task force with a lot of people who have a lot of brass on their sol sh sh shoulders said, what's the problem with the defense personnel system? It worked fine for me, uh, <laughs> which is why we were glad to have people like Amber and people who, who, who saw it from a different perspective involved. Um, and I think that's also one of the reasons why we're working a lot with Congress, because yes, maybe the Department of Defense has some of the authorities to create some of these more flexible programs, but as long as it's a pilot program, as long as it's just an experimental authority, um, it doesn't quite have the same, same weight. If it's something that is passed by legislation, by Congress, if it's something that's, that's rubber stamped, that's debated, um, it, it starts changing the culture a little bit more. So I think it takes time and there's no easy fix, but it does require um, change from the top, and not just from, from the uniform top, but from the civilian top as well. Uh, I, I was interested to hear uh, Secretary Wilson talk at the top here uh, about the Air Force's plans and effort to recruit more and focus more on drawing people from New England and other places where perhaps the military is not as common. I don't want to say it's unpopular. I think it's just le less, less discussed, less known at times. Uh, what recommendations would you have for her uh, or the military writ large as far as getting after that? So one of my favorite recommendations from our task force was uh, to have all 18-year-olds um, at time of selective service register, male and female, and as part of that, to, for all of them to take the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Boards and let everyone see what they would be good at in the military. That will tell them about jobs that they probably didn't even know they existed. It will give them a moment in every 18-year-old's lives where they picture themselves in the military. It will allow recruiters to see people who have unusual talents in certain areas to go in more depth. And even if people don't take them up on it, it will give them something that no one has right now, which is that a moment of even imagining themselves doing that. I think, frankly, that the military has such a great thing to offer on the face of it, having experienced the lifestyle, that that alone may be enough. Um, when people have it presented to them, there's, we only need 5% of 18 to 24-year-olds. But I think that would be a great place to start, and we could do it in a way that wouldn't be very expensive. I would say that um, it's a struggle. And uh, especially with what Kathy was talking to you before about how it's becoming more of a family business. And um, I think veterans and our military members are some of our own best communicators. And when it does become more of uh, a family um, recommending to their family members service, we then end up sort of talking in a circle. And once again, we are staying in the circle of the military um, instead of breaking out into that broader audience. What we need to get to. Uh, I'd like to flip the question around backwards, perhaps. Um, we're talking a lot about how can we get different people in, how can we get, uh, you know, more writ large, the, you know, the conversation of diversity of female service, all those sort of things come up. Uh, but on the flip side, there is a need and there will always be a large need for kind of the old traditional uh, folks who do sign up and enlist and kick in doors and all those sorts of things. And in my own reporting, I certainly see plenty of people who are very concerned when they hear these conversations, uh, who, aren't, who talk about leaving the military as a result, or talk about not joining as a result. How do you convey these messages of what DOD might need to do, while at the same cu time culturally acknowledging their concerns, uh, their frustrations, um, you know, and just the thought that we kind of need to be all of the above, probably? How do we get meat eaters and those kinds of folks in as well as 
public affairs officers. Sure. <laughs> um, well, uh, the Marine Corps does a pretty good job, right? So I think we can. Uh, <laughs> I, know, I know, I know. But I, I think we can, can look to those. There, there are people whose imagination is fired by that muscular, protective role. And, and I think continuing to, to speak to that is important. But perhaps even more important is what Amber is doing and why I so appreciate her taking the leadership with her department to do this. When I, I go out in the world and I speak a lot, and I speak a lot to non-military audiences and people far removed from our world because that's my job, is to make that bridge. And if I just talk to the room, it doesn't work. People, don't, people respect the military because they know they're supposed to. But they have no idea what we do and what that has to do with them. People have no idea that the price of food in their grocery stores has anything to do with the fact that we have people around the world. They have no idea that we have 200,000 people deployed to 150 countries every day. It's shocking to them. We have to tell the story. Civic education has somehow petered out in this country, and we don't understand the relationship between what our military does and our democratic way of life. Um, and we don't understand that it requires sustained effort around the globe. Now, you can debate whether you want to try to not do that and retrench, but you need to at least start with the idea that we are doing it. Here is why. Here are the. I can't even remember the count of the missions, something like 97 missions that we're doing currently around the globe. That's base level education. And it's hard to encourage someone to go do the job when they don't know what the job is and why we're even doing it. I think that's, we're, we're getting to that with this um, campaign. Blue Star Families is really going to be robustly supporting it. I hope other people here do too. But I, I think we need to be honest that most people have no idea why we do what we do. So you have to be able to adapt to survive. And I would say that you know, what was needed 20 years ago, what was needed 10 years ago, society has changed, technology has changed, it's constantly evolving. Um, and we need to make sure we're staying up with that. So yes, we'll always need the trigger pullers. We'll always need that component of the military. But we also need cyber. We need the medical field. We need engineers. We need different uh, sides that all contribute to the fighting force, um, but maybe are going to be a little bit different background, a little bit different interests. This is a, a, a bit far afield, but probably not as much as probably it'll initially sound. How is pop culture helping or hurting in this regard? So. Uh, I would say that, uh, as I mentioned when I was briefing, uh, we, who is the younger generation paying attention to today? They're paying attention to social media influencers and stars. They're paying attention to TV, Hollywood, movie stars, and then really some of the sports influencers as well. And so they actually, um, whether they appreciate it or care that they have a voice in, in uh, when they talk about the military and who's serving in the military and what we do, they actually do have a significant influence. Uh, and so I would say that, you know, a lot of times those areas focus on the heroes of the military. They, um, you know, save the day. They now have a movie. They're these you know, larger than life individuals. And then you have the individuals who I mentioned that a lot of society connects with veterans today as they're broken, they're victims, they're not able to um, adjust back into society. When I would say those are the two far extremes, like on a bell curve, you have everybody else that exists as veterans. And so that's what we want to take a look at is all the people in between. You've got all of these fantastic Americans who decided to serve their country. And let's talk about them. They didn't have to, you know, be these heroes that are going to have to have a movie made about them, but they still contributed a lot. And that's, we, we want to get to know those people. We want America to get to know those people. We need to speak pop culture ease. And we need to develop relationships with the people who are ma manipulating the popular culture so that they can know us, we can know them, and we can affect the message. Where are they getting it right? 
Well, I think, you know, listen, look at this beautiful um, Hidden Heroes campaign with Elizabeth Dole and the um, uh, movie stars Tom Hanks um, and uh, Wall Street Journal. That's a, that's a great campaign. So when you can get that level of influencers working together, you can get some, some beautiful things happening. Um, we, you know, it sometimes seems fluffy, but we, we work with Warner Brothers to try to get on the red carpet of places like, uh, what was that, 12? 12, 12, 12 Strong. To tell our story a little bit to those folks while we're doing other things. Real people who have the opportunity to be better because of their service. We don't all take that opportunity. We're not all awesome. There's a lot of jerks in the uniform. But the opportunity to serve allows us the opportunity to, um, to be better. We need to be, you know, and we need to share that, that aspect of the story. Also, I would say support. They're getting it right with support. Uh, I, I think I don't want to, um, the support for the military is arguably at an all-time high. Um, and that is not something to just glance over. I think that's fantastic in terms of the way society really has rallied around the military in terms of they, they appreciate their service and, and what they're doing. Um, that, I think, is where they're getting it right. And I think just as importantly, although it's not popular culture, I think we could be poised to see a reversal of the trends that Secretary Wilson talked about, about the number of veterans that are serving in Congress. I think you're going to see a large wave in 2018 and moving forward uh, of young millennials who served in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and now want to have a say uh, in shaping the national security and foreign policy and domestic politics of our country going forward. Uh, and I think that's a good thing uh, for, for both parties to have these people engaged and for societies to see visible, highly successful uh, people who, who have served and then are now going on to serve their countries. Uh, this is probably a question mostly for Kathy, but, but please feel free to answer whoever. Um, that really is the first time in the last hour that politics itself and perhaps the polarization in politics has come up. Um, what are your challenges as far as conveying the concerns that you see when you look at your survey? What are the problems as far as getting that voice into Congress um, when people are so far retrenched uh, you know, this year, this, these last five years, wherever you want to put it? This terrible di political divide we are having is actually an enormous opportunity for people who are advocating for military and military families, such as Blue Star families, because we are a place that people can all really come together. Everyone has a home in caring about our military, supporting them and connecting them to the country. So I think we find a, a higher level of enthusiasm, I think, for engaging with us. Because we are a one America place, we are a place where there is more that unites us than divides us. And the culture divide really doesn't exist um, inside this world. Because when you sign up to serve, and we have to always say this to people, you have no idea what president you are going to be serving in your future. You don't say, huh, you know, wor work in Syria, work in uh, North Korea. That's what I want to do. I'm going to sign up. You don't know what your missions are. That's the, it's the most basic democratic move that you can take because you're giving it up to the political wills, how, how the democratic um, forces shape the future. And I think we are able to take advantage of that and find equally fervent supporters on every side of the aisle. And that's a good thing. That's what it should be. Uh, Blaze, from your perspective, you know, bipartisan organization, how's that square? Look, I think this is actually one of the issues in the national security space that I'm the most optimistic about, although I guess in comparison to North Korea or the Middle East, that's not <laughs> terribly hard. But, but it is, you know, the sort of the respect for our service members, the need to, to help our service members, I think is something that, that is universal and cuts across party lines. Uh, you know, so, for example, in the last National Defense Authorization Act, we were able to get Senator Gillibrand and Senator Cotton to work together to author a bill to, to try to create uh, better opportunities for more flexible uh, child care on military bases, right? Because it is not necessarily a partisan issue. It is an issue that both, both sides can, can support. Um, and so I think it's actually a place where, you know, even where, when today and tomorrow we're going to be fighting over military funding, perhaps, in the budget, uh, you can, you know, go even deeper than that and say trying to build a force uh, that is sustainable for the long term, a force that protects all of us in the future, something that, that I think a lot of people buy into. 
Uh, I, I think where, where there is more divide, uh, as your question hinted at earlier, Dan, is, you know, is, is more this sort of older view of the military versus the newer view of the military, right? There, there are the people who say the military is about, uh, you know, marching information and pulling triggers and, and tanks and artillery, and, and we don't want any newfangled stuff. Uh, uh, and I think that's more of the issue and that, uh, that it crosses part partisan lines rather than an, any one party affiliation. Uh, lightning round and then we'll open it up. Uh, a quick answer, if you would, each. What is one surprise you didn't expect uh, in your work over the last several months? I'll go, I guess. Uh, I would say just how uh, much interest there has been in terms of the Department of Defense involvement in the civilian military divide um, issue, you could say. Uh, I think people are very happy to see us getting involved um, to sort of work towards bridging that gap with the American public. The fact that time away from family was the number one concern for service members surprised me. It's never shown up anywhere on any survey I've seen for top concerns for service members. It's never shown up for us in the past because we never asked it in the past. Uh, we only asked it because we got so many qualitative responses we thought we should put it in, and I did not realize it was going to go to the top. So that's, that's surprising to me and important. I was going to echo that in conversations I have with service members. I've now started asking them about this, and I, I'm surprised how, how many say their number one concern in service is frequent changes of duty stations. But since Kathy said that, uh, let me say, say another that gets to your, your previous question, Dan, which is uh, I am surprised how how this issue brings people together. And, and just as an example, you know, the, the, the two co-chairs of our, our commission, Kathy and Senator Jim Talent, uh, you know, a, a conservative Republican who, who I think came into this work with us, mostly focused on how do we build a, a better, stronger, bigger military, uh, and really em embrace these issues. And I think seeing sort of the friendship, if I can, if I can say that, Kathy, that, that developed as a result of working together um, to try to, 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 to create a better military it was really impressive to me. Uh, we'd like to open up the questions. I imagine we'll have some microphones running around the room. Please remember the microphone is not only for us up here, uh, and so you can hear each other in the room, but also because there are people watching online, so we really do need those. Let's start right in front. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, Amber, I'd like to introduce you to Rob Wilkins with Military Times, the largest defense newspaper in the world, as you do your messes out there. My, my thing is going back to your title, who will serve in America's future military? And I will tell you, I always use the term, we train for the preservation of peace, but in reality, we're in the business of war. I mean, that's the reality. With the number 22, with social media, all these wounded warrior campaigns, commercials, the, the majority of kids are scared. And I will tell you this, as you do your survey, I would love to see the ones and zeros. I'm an engineer by trade. Let me tell you real quick my background. I grew up in a gangs of Houston, Texas. I mean, literally, I, was, I, was, I joined the military because I was going to get killed. Then I was lucky enough to go to Air Force Academy, go Air Force, and do some really cool stuff in my career. But my kids, one thing we would say is the invisible wounds. I'm a Purple Heart recipient, so is Charles. We have a Navy SEAL back there that's a Purple Heart recipient as well. And we have a core group that we hang out together to help out. We lend, and we're, I'm offering our assistance to help you. But like my children, I have a senior and a freshman. They will never join the military. I'm not discouraging them, but they've seen the hell that I've been through and the hell that they've experienced. So I wonder in your survey, are you doing that? Are you looking into the closed doors that people don't want to talk about? The ugliness, the, you know, the, the police flash car lights out there, the stuff that goes with it. So I think the biggest, the biggest challenge you're going to face is social media itself. Kids have experienced it. They're, they really are, are scared because you said you'll go into the military, you are come out broken. It's, it's almost true when you start seeing everything out there. Well, that's exactly what we have seen with some of our data is that people have this... Uh, I do feel like it is a misperception, though. Um, I work in this every single day, um, and I know from my own experiences as well. Um, obviously, it exists, just like you said, with your own personal story in terms of um, some of the negatives that have happened to individuals. Um, and that absolutely exists. I hear those stories as well. But I think as big picture, um, you know, across the board, military, it really does have some great things to offer individuals. And in terms of the initiative and what I'm doing, I'm not trying to, this isn't about getting people to join the military. This is a strictly 
educational, informative an initiative to give people facts so then they can hear it sort of from both sides. That's what we're trying to do. Please don't get me wrong. I will do it all over again knowing what mm -hmm. I've been through and do it because it was the best thing that happened in my life. My point is how do we combat Sure. That, that, that stigma out there, how do we fix it? You know, we're here to help you. Absolutely, and that's why we want to engage with the people who do have those stories so we can make sure that we are accurately telling a story that people need to hear. So that's we want to tell people's stories. We have a, a one-pager. Did we, Heather, did we put that? That says benefits of service. It may be on your chair. Yeah, it, it on the table. On the table outside. So I urge you to take a look at that and share it. And it, it's from our survey. But people are saying in extraordinary numbers, I'm glad I served. I would do it again. I learned leadership. We need to put those messages out, too. You should take those out on the road with you as well. Um, so take a look at that. Over there on the, my, uh, my left, my, my far left. Thank you. Stacy Bridges, um, Veterans Vision. Great um, panel today. You guys pretty much answered all my questions, which is good, because now it's difficult to keep me quiet. Um, my thing is, if we want to increase um, recruitment, we've got to take care of our veterans. And um, we have to take care of their spouses. And I think we're all in agreement to that. There are companies like Amazon and JP Morgan that are offering college classes that are training the spouses while their um, significant other are serving. Um, we need to make sure, not only that we support our troops, but to make sure that um, Congress and the Hill support our troops too and our veterans as well and by cutting benefits and services that can cut into recruitment as well so how do you look at as far as cuts how is that hurting recruitment and and and, and eventually it will hurt us on the battlefield and the battlefields are going to be fought here at home just so we know it's going to be a cyber warfare it's going to be a social media warfare so how are we going to recruit those young people and make sure they, they join the military like this nice gentleman over here just did, and thank you again for everything that you've done. But I can't blame your kids for not wanting to join because of the lack of services that are being cut. So what, what can we do to prevent that stuff from happening and make sure those services are accessible to the family members? Any of the above. So, I mean, I can speak to some of the recommendations that, that, that we've come up with that I think help address some of that. Uh, one is we need to be doing a better job preparing our service members when they transition into, into being veterans. Uh, and we can do some of that just by the way that, that we train and align career paths. If the training that you're getting in the military more closely matches certifications that you need to do that job in the civilian sector, it's easier for you to get a job and explain what you've done, what the skills that you have to a civilian employer. Uh, I think the work that Amber is doing about Know Your Military so that employers actually understand the value of having uh, a veteran on their staff, uh, the experience and the skills and the leadership that they can bring uh, is also critical. Uh, I think there's also important things that need to be done uh, when it comes to, to health care. One of the things that we talk about is the absurdity uh, that the DOD and the VA's uh, health records don't match up, that you can't transfer them. Maybe it's something for, for Booz Allen to work on, I don't know. But uh, you know, some of these, 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 these IT problems that st strike all of us as something that should be simple but yet proves complicated. Um, and I think there's actually good things being done in the benefits space when it comes for, to, to recruitment and retention. Uh, such as the new blended retirement system, right? You can now tell people, you can come in and you're going to get money being put into your retirement almost right away, and you can take that with you. You don't have to stay in 20 years to see a benefit, right, for the military to actually pay you back for, for your service. Um, but I'd be interested to hear from, from Kathy. My sense is uh, for the 18-year-olds that are signing up, benefits isn't really the reason, right, that, that, that they're deciding to sign up. Uh, at least not, not some of the, the far-reaching ones, right? Maybe they know about GI Bill. Maybe they know that they're going to be able to get an education out of this. Uh, but I don't think that's really the top reason. So uh, I see benefits as more of a retention issue uh, and less of a recruitment issue. But I'd be interested to what the, what the data supports. Um, that's true with the exception of education. Yeah. We're finding education is uh, the top issue. And it's, it, with millennials, it's become the top issue. Prior to millennials, um, it was desire to serve. Now desire to serve is number two and education is number one. Uh, Mac Meese. 
Yes, over here. And uh, at the same time, uh, after this question, I wanted to flag, uh, do we have any questions coming in through social media as well? Yeah, Mike Meese with American Armed Forces Mutual Aid Association. I want to thank uh, the panel. Uh, again, the Blue Star survey is about the best one that's out there for anything. And then also, the, uh, I'm glad that Blaze mentioned the blended retirement because that's where my question really is. It's interesting that we did an hour and a half and did not mention the largest change toward personnel in, since World War II, which is the adoption of the blended retirement started on January 1st and is now going to have everybody have for a 401k type system. What's interesting, uh, kind of for Amber, DOD is not, uh, DOD is very focused internally on the conversion of everybody from the old system to the new system, where nobody is forced into the new system unless they voluntarily opt to do that, which is probably why retirement was not a huge concern on those little word bubbles, because DOD managed to do that right. And now DOD has a brand new thing that appeals to millennials, but I haven't seen anybody, any military leader, tout it, talk about it, or when they're testifying before Congress, say, for the first time since 1986, we've done entitlement reform, and it started with the military, where is entitlement reform across the rest of government? It's a great point, Mike, and it's a great um, area, a big win for policymakers, because Retirement was uh, number two or number one issue for the last several years, and it dropped this last year because um, the reform was done right. They had a commission. It was open. There was a lot of opportunity to, for people to comment. There was a feeling that it was fair and um, transparent, and people had a, a chance to weigh in, which is what has not happened in the past and what has made previous systems fail. What we see in our survey this year is that people are no longer worried and anxious about retirement but they don't understand the new system. So that's a job for you. That's a great job for you know, banks and credit unions and insurance companies. What it shows us, I don't think they'll stay comfortable long if they continue to not understand it. We need to step in and help them understand it, but there's this little pause of, um, I think, faith that the system worked properly, and now we need to get, them, get people understanding it and making their choices. Uh, did we have any social media questions we wanted to bring up? Yeah, I think that's you. Um, we had a question from Twitter in regard to, thank you, in regard to the lack of veterans recommending service to their family members. They would like to know if you saw a difference um, in opinion based on family by years of service or enlisted versus officer ranks when it came to that data. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, we, we haven't taken a cross-section on that yet, but that's a, a great hypothesis to test out for future research. And because you asked that question, we will look at that. So whoever text, uh, hashtag that in, let, let us know, and we'll get back to you. Right here in the back. Good morning. Margaret Cope, retired Air Force. Um, thank you to the whole panel and to the discussion this morning, but especially thank you to Kathy of Blue Star Families for your comment with regard to the Selective Service Law. That issue is huge and has been for over 30 years that women do not register. And the law could be changed today if, if, if Congress were willing. In fact, it was addressed a year ago and um, the Senate passed it, no problem, but the House did not uh, because we don't want to draft our daughters, they said. Um, but along with that, um, what about the other people, the 75% that are not eligible because of physical issues and others? Um, how about, say, a national service concept um, that would be available that might have more lenient um, requirements and might attract some folks that would not go into the military, but they could still do a national service requirement of, say, two years minimum um, and have similar training, but maybe not as rigorous as the military and maybe with more leeway? I, I think it's a fantastic idea. And uh, Senator McCain, who's a hero on this issue and so many others, has set up a task force that's opening today, a, a National Commission on Military, Public, and um, National. National Service. And um, we're going to be participating in that commission. I encourage you to weigh in with it. I think they need to hear that people want this and think it's a good idea. Um, it, it's, it's a great way forward 
I think. Go to the very back of the room over there. Hey, good morning. I'm Scott Cooper. I'm a retired Marine. Uh, I've got a question about uh, marriages in service. Uh, I can remember when Carl Money was coming out in 1993, they um, mentioned an idea that they would not recruit Marines uh, that had been married. Um, we've changed the conversation a bit, but I'd like to just bring up an example and ask for uh, your opinions and ideas on options. A week after I took command a couple of years ago of a flying squad in the Marine Corps, I had a Lance Corporal and a Corporal that got married. Um, and we were getting ready to go to Afghanistan. And of course, you can't take a married couple with you um, according to the policy because General Order 1 says you can't cohabitate, you can't have sex. And that would have been a sentence where they would have seen each other maybe one month a year. And so I gathered my staff and CEOs and said, what do you think? And every single one said they should, they should go with us. And so we fought the battle and it was a successful deployment and they're still married and it's actually a success story. But we had to ask for an exception because there's a bias against it. Do you have ideas about policies on which we might make it, well, more convenient for service members to marry, to deploy together, or the like? I do not. No. I think it's 100% the kind of thing we, we need to be doing and, and raising up. Um, and we'll look into what the current status of that is, how much it's changed. Because, um, again, looking from a human center design, what's, what's the human experiencing? And how do we let that human do their best job fighting? It's not by arbitrarily separating um, spouses because we're afraid of spouses being together. It's a legacy thing. It's a great, it's a great flag, and um, and I'm glad you were able to fight through and do the right thing. Good, good on you. That's awesome. Uh, any more good social media questions? We have a lot of comments coming in. Everyone thinks you all did fabulous. Um, <laughs> We have another Twitter question. They would like to know where they can find the internships available to intern with the Air Force that Secretary Wilson spoke about. Air Force. Air Force. Air Force. We'll get back to her. Okay, we'll, we'll ask if the you're Air listening, Force to we'll get back, back to, to you. Yeah. <laughs> we'll post it on our site. Great. Yes, right here. Thank you very much, Larry Checo. This is a bit of a testimonial, actually. Um, I'm not from a military family, but my son is a, is a Marine Corps reservist. And uh, quite frankly, in all honesty, we tried to keep him from going in, went in, and has come out a really good human being, a true person, really. And uh, I really respect the values that the military has given him. Um, tough kid to raise, great human being to watch now. Uh, the other, but I have a second point here that was the testimonial. I really like the idea of this um, civilian military uh, program. And I think, I'm in branding, so uh, I think one of the things you really could focus on more, and somebody brought it up, is the commercialization of the military. In other words, how does the military out there really affect us at home? You know, it's protecting the seas, it's keeping us open to trade. All of that, and I think you really have to pull on those points, because I think most people who, like me, prior to my son going into the military, saw it as all violence. It's not all violence. There's a lot more to it than that, and I, I would like to think that this program can do that. And I also am in agreement with uh, my cohort here, Margaret, that national service would be a great way to, to move some of this forward. Thank you. Thank you for your story, and that's exactly like what you said. How can the everyday American relate to the military? That's exactly what we want to do. So thanks. I think we got time for one more. We're going to see a couple hands up in the back. Okay. <laughs> Morning. My name is Larry Cherigino. I, uh, I, I didn't hear one issue discussed today, and it, it centers around the survey and, and the environment in which we work in the military, and that's the size of the military installations and the proliferation of these cities of a quarter million with the associated crime and poverty and other social issues that, that come with that kind of concentration of people. Um, PNR has not been successful against the Comptroller in, in fighting this trend, although they've tried over the years. Is there anything to be done to help us get back so that we have more military installations with the American public and people live and work with more people uh, rather than be concentrated in these huge cities? I think 
um, Matt Bourne is here, aren't you? From uh, yeah, Association of Defense Communities. Um, having our communities integrated with our military installations and vice versa is incredibly important to the health of our force. Um, and uh, uh, having those communities have a voice and, uh, and work on that healthy relationship as well as us doing a better job in allowing the commanders, the garrison commanders, to open up to those communities is really key. With 9-11, um, the wire came up around these domestic installations. And now, often there's no commerce in between the people outside the gate and inside the gate. And that, that really hurts us. We need to find ways to break through, understands force protection, but um, increase the commerce between the two groups. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but, but that's, that's really an important issue about how we, had, we work with the communities around the installations. Blaze, you had a comment? I, I mean, I was just going to say that that's, I think, going to be a, a continuous battle, especially with some pushing for a new round of BRACs. So you're going to get further consolidation, further expansion of bases. Uh, on a slightly different note, uh, interestingly, I was having a conversation with, with a Marine this weekend, and I now ask very different questions when I talk to service members than I did before we did this project, Kathy. <laughs> but I was asking him about his experience in service and, and what his concerns were, and I was surprised. His first one was... was PCSing, frequent changes of duty station. But a second one, interesting, was that bases are too big. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, we're Marines. We're supposed to be running and walking and fit, and now everyone's driving everywhere. Yeah. Bases are too big. I, like, oh, I haven't heard that one. Um, but I think uh, part of what, what Kathy refers to as human-centered design, partly thinking about how we do get bases and their communities better integrated, it goes through everything. It goes to child care. How do we get civilian child care providers to pick up some of the slack when when DOD isn't doing it. It goes to schools. How do we ensure that the schools and military communities are up to snuff and are, are, and are, are doing a good job educating the children of our military service members? Um, I think all of that goes hand in hand and maybe isn't tied as much to size as it is to t some of these issues about breaking down the, the going by, beyond the wire, breaking down the divide. All right. Uh, I think with that, we're, we're pretty much out of time. I uh, wanted to thank each of our guests once again. Um, I jumped at the opportunity to uh, sit down on the stage with you today. I thought this was a really important mission and discussion. So thanks, everyone. Thank you.